So um, what I wanted to talk about is when I started programming in Go, I started writing really quite large programs. And the reason I did that was the concurrency that was available. Suddenly it was like, okay, I don't have to mess around with threads and I can get really cheap concurrency. And Go was really replacing things I might have written in, say, C or uh, some other languages, even perhaps in Java sometimes. And because of the concurrency, it was, it was nice. What I noticed over time, over the last three years, I started writing smaller programs in Go. And in particular, things that I might have previously done in a scripting language, uh, I started writing in Go. And the reason for this turned out to be that, well, I was better at writing Go, of course, um, but also because the standard packages are extremely powerful. The concurrency is nice, or all of our machines have got lots of CPUs, lots of cores. And also, it was easier to refactor things because of interfaces. And so I thought I'd look at, in this talk, an actual real small program I wrote in Go. It's only about 75 lines uh, that came about because of something I was doing at work. So I was in the Cloudflare office in London, happily, quietly working by myself, when uh, my phone popped up and somebody said, I urgently need a program written that can take a list of websites and figure out whether they are Cloudflare customers or not. This is a real request. This isn't quite how it appeared, but this is close enough. Um, and I don't actually have a carrier called Plan 9 in London. So, um, <laughs> And I replied and I said, yeah, sure, obviously. I mean, that's, you know, that's not that hard to do. What do you mean by on Cloudflare? And the person replied and said, oh, well, there's about 2 million sites I need you to check. Um, and all you need to do is check whether their DNS name server is one of our Cloudflare name servers. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty easy. My, you know, I'll get on that. I can write that. I'm sure I can whip this out. And my first thought was exargs. Um, <laughs> obviously, you know, people in the Cloudflare office accuse me every day of using exargs. So I thought, you know, I'll get that thing. I'll pipe it into exargs. I'll use dig. Then I'll grep out the name server lines. That'll be easy. Uh, then I'll use cut to actually get the zone. Then I'll sort it. Then I'll unique it. So I was like, that, I'll be done, right? There's no problem. I don't even have to write code for this. And then I was like, wait a minute, how long do these things take? So I looked up my own zone, which is on Cloudflare, and it took 34 milliseconds. And I was like, 34 milliseconds times 2 million. OK, I'll use Wolfram Alpha. OK, <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about 18 hours to do it. And I was like, damn it, Chloe, we don't have 18 hours to do this thing. All right? So <laughs> I have to do something now. So I also, of course, the immediate question is I could have used GNU Parallel instead of Xargs. But what if dig fails? What if there's some network error? And also the output of dig isn't structured. It turns out that if you start looking for tabs, sometimes it uses spaces. And I was like, you know what? This looks like a job for this guy. All right, this is, this is what I'm going to do. This guy is going to help me out. So bam, just get Emacs, open up Emacs. I know there may be Vim users here, and I'm sorry if that does upset you. Um, so this is the rough architecture of the thing I wanted to build. I wanted something that could read lines on standard in and stuff them down some channel. Say, so I've read this thing. Here's a, here's a job to do. In this case, it's a zone, right? And I'll have a whole load of Go routines that call, oh, look, there's something in the standard alert packages, net lookup ns. So that's dead easy. I can look up name servers like that, and I can spin up loads of those. And those things will stuff their result. Is it on Cloudflare? Did something go wrong down some other channel? And someone else will write it to stand it out. So pretty, pretty nice, simple architecture. And it turns out Go is great for this. So the first thing I did was I created a little type. So I created this lookup type. And the lookup type says, well, OK, there's a name. That's the actual website I'm looking up. And then when I get this thing back again, so this will go down the in channel. When it comes out of being processed, it'll have a flag saying whether it was on Cloudflare and also an error, just in case something went wrong, because unfortunately things go wrong in the real world. And then I sort of start writing this. And I was like, oh, well, it's pretty simple, right? If you want to read standard in and stuff it down a channel, uh, the really nice thing is you have this buff IO scanner thing. So that's trivial, right? It's just like that, that's a loop in the middle there is three lines of code. And you just create one of these lookup things, and you stuff it down a channel. And when you're done, you close the channel. So you fill the channel with stuff, finished. And then the outputting it, um, so yeah, as, and I use a wait group. So we use a wait group just to wait for everything to be cleaned up in the end. Given that this was a, com a little command line program, I could have been naughty and just you know, exited the program and said, bye, go routines. But you know, it's kind of nice to clean up. So I use a wait group for that. And then uh, well, writing the results is easy, right? You just range over the output channel, reading all the stuff that's coming out of those worker go routines in the middle, and do some switch statement to figure out what you're going to print. You're going to say, yeah, it was on Cloudflare, or it was an error, or whatever you were doing. So I've got those two things at the, each end. Right in, they come, and out they go. And then you've got to have your worker go routines. Well, I created a 1,000 of them. 
Um, you could actually use, you know, the flag passage and have a flag here to tell you how many you want to do. I just said, just a thousand go routines. One of the nice things about go routines is they're so cheap, I, I just, I just create them, you know. It's like fast food or something. You just go, yeah, I'll have 10,000 go routines, just do that. And, um, you know, we add those to the wait group so we can wait for them all to be done. And then all these things are just ranging on that input channel. So the really nice thing about these channels, there's only two channels in this program. There's no complicated channels of channels and all sorts of stuff going on. There's one thing stuffing into in, there's a thousand things sitting there waiting on in saying, have you got a job for me to do? Or if it's being closed, of course, then it ends. And they do a job and they all thousand can stuff things down the out channel, the, the finished lookup. So this is what one of the go routines looks like. And the middle of it is pretty simple. You just call lookup name server, figure out what to do with it, figure out if it's a Cloudflare name server and set the appropriate flags. So really, you know, not a very, very big program. And uh, this is 75 lines ago. I don't expect you to read what's on the, uh, on the screen there, but that's the entire program. So the entire program is, is very, very simple. It's highly concurrent. Uh, the standard packages are great. And actually, if you really want to replace my XARG sort unique cut thing, the one line is you just do go run that program and pipe in the list of zones. And that just works. And this ran in about an hour and a half. So it manages to do all of them. So I think Jack managed to get to rescuing the president or whatever after he got this. So, okay, five minutes later, it says, I urgently need another program written that can take a list of Tor exit nodes and score them against Project Honeypot. I was like, okay, I'll write that, you know, and I was like, exargs and, you know, blah, blah, look at the API. And then two minutes later, it's like, I urgently need another program written. These are real programs I was asked to write. Uh, that can read a CSV file and use parts of it to call a JSON API for each row in the file. And I was like, I'm not writing this again. I'm not writing this program three times, basically, because it's, it's the same kind of thing. So what we need is interfaces. So this is like, now I've got a concrete program. I can now refactor it using interfaces. And here's a really nice thing about Go. Rather than thinking from the start, what's my type hierarchy going to be like and all this kind of thing, I started from a real program, the Is It On Cloudflare program. And now I can generalize it to this other use. And so off we go. So what have we got? Well, there's the original architecture of the thing. There's something on the side there which is producing work to do. There's a whole load of things that perform the work, and there's something that takes the done work and outputs it. So we can break that up. And so we start with two things. So I call one of them a factory. If anyone here is a Java programmer, there is no factory, like creating factory, factory, factories, or anything here. This is just a thing that can take a line that's been given to it from standard in and output a task. And a task is another interface. A task is something that can be processed, i.e., in the first example, can do the NS lookup, but whatever the processing is. And when it's done, it can be printed. So it can be output to stand it out. So, it has those, so, those, so there's really only three things you've got to implement here. The input bit where you make something to make a new task, and then you process it, and then you print it out. And a lovely thing about Go here is that I didn't actually have to worry about who had this type in what hierarchy. I was just like, this is the interface. I just written it down. Nothing else had to be changed. So we've got a factory and a task. And then I just made myself a really dumb lookup factory. So this is for the original program. And all it does is it creates one of those lookup types, those structures, from a line. So it was just, this is just taking the one line from the original code and turning it into that. So now I've got a factory. Now I've got something that can take lines and do that. And then I wanted to implement task. So task now, to just take that bit that was all about processing the NS lookup and stuff it in a function called process. So now I've implemented that part of the interface. And then I need print. Well, again, just take that bit that was about printing and, in, and put it into print. So now I've got this, this lookup now implements the task interface. And OK, so running it. So now I've created a new function. So this is my generalized version called run. And it takes one of these factories. It takes something that's capable of making tasks. And instead now of having a channel of a concrete type, the structure lookup, I've now got a channel of tasks. This is, this is one of those times, and it was interesting in the previous talk about how difficult interfaces are. Now I'm passing down a channel anything that satisfies that interface. In this case, it's going to be my lookup thing, but it can also be the other three programs or two programs I was asked to write. It could be something different that implements that, but the same code will work in the same way. And all it's doing is scanning standard in and calling that factory's make interface on the thing that was scanned from standard in to make a new task, and it sticks the, star, the task down the channel. So all of, the, all of the actual realities of this, of what's really going on, has been abstracted. It could be, in the original example, something that was fairly simple, which was a single line with a zone name in it, a DNS name in it. Or it could be the final example, where it's some CSV thing, which I've got to parse, but that is all hidden in make. 
The next bit of run is the thing that receives the output and prints it out. Well, that's trivial. It just gets the tasks from the out channel, which is now a channel of tasks, and prints them using that interface. Again, that was, that was pretty trivial. And then the actual Go routines now are even simpler. There's a thousand of them. Uh, I add them the weight group up, and then I range over the input channel until I run out of things to input, and I just call process on them. And when I'm done processing it, I stuff it down the out channel. So that original simple thing that I whipped up for that particular task has now become something extremely generic just by specifying an interface for doing this. And finally, when this thing is about to be finished, I go down here at the bottom and I do wait. So I just wait for all the routines to terminate and then I'm friendly and I close the output channel. That will cause the final go routine, the one that does the outputs, to terminate. So now I've got this one function that I can use to all, for all these tasks. And that means I've got more time to drink coffee and pretend I'm working. Uh, no, wait a minute, I've got more time to work on other things. Um, and main is trivial, right? I just say run on one of these blank lookup factory things, and that's it. And now all I need to do is implement the appropriate types of those other programs, and you've got a generic program. So just to give you an idea of how this program actually executes, because sometimes it's a little bit tricky to think about what's happening, this is sort of the starting state. Once you've run this program and it's ready to go, you've got a Go routine which is looping, doing make, getting things from standard in, continuously calling make, and shuffling it into the input channel. You've then got a thousand Go routines waiting on the input channel, calling process on anything it gets, and stuffing the output, the same task, into the output channel. And there's a final Go routine which is looping, on the output channel, printing stuff, so just printing to standard out. And so the weight group is, there's a thousand and one things in the weight group at this point. And then what happens is, at some point, uh, we're going to run out of standard in, so the input channel gets closed, that go routine terminates, the weight group goes down. And then the next thing that happens is that slowly the workers run out of jobs to do. So they start terminating and the weight group count spins down. And eventually we run out of jobs that are happening, the weight group goes to zero, we finish doing all that, that work, the weight group uh, wait will exit, close the output channel, everything's done, and finally the output loop terminates. And so the program is done, all the channels are closed, all the go routines have gone away. And you think about it, this is now a very, very useful program, and I push it up onto GitHub if anyone needs to write things that take stuff in standard in, run them on loads of go routines and output them, it's on there, and you can go take it. Or, I actually suggest you don't look at my code, I suggest you go, if you haven't written something like this, go and write it, to convince yourself how easy it is, because I would have previously have written this in another language. I probably would have done it in Perl, because that was the language. I might well have done it with Python for that sort of thing. But honestly, Go is now eating into my scripting, uh, because of how powerful it is, and particularly because of the concurrency, when you have lots of things to do. So, my conclusion really is that, because you get trivially easy concurrency from Go, that's obvious. But that's one of the things that you know, I initially attracted me to go for the initial projects I worked on. But you also get this ability to refactor and make generality because of interfaces that is also almost as trivial. It's, there's a conceptual problem with it. It's a little bit tricky to understand how interfaces work. But once you do, you suddenly realize you can just refactor. And that code I wrote went from about 75 lines to about 100 lines to get a completely generic version that also did the original task as well. So my message is really that if you're coming to this from writing big programs and moving them into Go, then Go is great for that. And if you're coming to it from writing things in scripting languages, small scripting programs, Go is good for that as too. You need to meet in the middle. I think Go is actually very good for all these, all these tasks. And I think we're going to see a variety of things get written in it. I know that for me, it's probably time for me to retire my Perl books and, and move on now. It probably was 10 years ago, actually, truthfully. But, you know. Anyway, if you want the code, it's up on, my, on the GitHub as .go. And thank you very much. <laughs>